Okay. Um, so welcome to our event after the General Assembly of Democracy International. We have named it uh, how we got here and where we are going, Modern Direct Democracy Today. And I have the honor of presenting our keynote speaker today. Um, he is a man who describes himself as an initiative and referendum nerd, if I can quote his Facebook profile. Uh, and BBC says uh, um, he is the world's leading expert on referendums. He is Dr. Professor Matt Quartrup. He is Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the Coventry University. He is an expert in referendums, European politics and comparative politics. He is holder of, um, I guess, several prizes, though I uh, found only the um, in his biography facts um, and found the, uh, that he is a holder of the Political Studies Association Prize uh, for his research on political institutions and policy outputs. I guess his most um, uh, popular book uh, that is translated, uh, most translated, is his book um, about Angela Merkel um, <clears throat> as the um, as a super leader, yes. And um, uh, he has been also advisor to um, a lot of uh, governmental committees, um, American and European, uh, his national government too. Uh, Mr. Kvortrup's uh, writing uh, has always uh, been uh, uh, more than interesting to me. I'm a great fan and have read him wildly, though I have never met him in person. And uh, I am appreciative of his uh, uh, lucid writing, of his um, clear statements, and also his sense of humor. And I will immediately share a joke I like very much. Maybe I will uh, um, redo it. I don't remember it exactly, but it was uh, um, when he was addressing the issue of uh, parties and referendums, he noted uh, somewhere that uh, uh, parties like the idea of referendum as much as turkeys like the idea of Christmas. Um, so his new book, Matt Kvortrup's new book is uh, uh, called uh, Democracy on Demand. And um, I like this idea very much uh, uh, about the demand driven democracy. Uh, because uh, uh, it implies that we need to have mechanisms and forms, deliberative, direct decision-making or whatever, uh, to address uh, diverse needs of our democracies and not just the uh, party, pa party centric uh, uh, thing, the mediation of parties that is uh, uh, imposed on us as the only way of addressing problems. Um, so I guess um, um, in his findings, he will um, um, illuminate us also on uh, not only on direct decision making, initiative and referendum, but also on uh, forums like the citizens assembly, citizen juries, citizen uh, uh, budget, and how they can be uh, fit for, for different uh, citizens' needs of different social groups and political minorities and why not majorities for example in my country i think that we do not have problem of expressing political minorities but more uh, we have a case of an endangered majority uh, that have has no say in uh, uh, in policy making um, so um, i give you professor matt quartrup enjoy uh, thank you very much, Daniela. That's, uh, you made me blush now, so I'm, 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 I'm quite sort of, uh, uh, you made me also feel that I have to live up to something. Uh, but then I went, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's good with a little bit of pressure there. Um, now, I should say by, by way of introduction that, in a way, I am just a political scientist. I'm not like you, for instance, and Daniela, and the other Daniela I can see on the screen, and many other people. I'm not out there actually doing things. And in writing the book, uh, Democracy on Demand, uh, I drew on a lot of people. I interviewed a lot of people, uh, Orno Kaufmann, who was the narrator of that wonderful video I just saw. Uh, it was one of the people I spoke to. And I think when I go through the list of the, of the people I thank in 
book. Uh, that's basically all the people I can see uh, there on my screen up there. So, so in a way, I am just uh, the narrator of your story. Um, but, uh, but somebody has to tell the story and, uh, and other people, of course, have told the story in other ways as well. Um, I think if we can just sort of go back to the democracy on demand uh, issue. Um, now, nowadays, we have a lot of this sort of stuff on, on demand. We have print on demand. Uh, I think some you know, old books, if, if they're no longer in the bookshop, you can get them print on demand. So we can sort of, as consumers, uh, take the initiative. We can say, well, we want to empower ourselves. Um, and today, very sort of basically speaking, we live in the age of Netflix or the age of Spotify or, or whatever. When I grew up in, uh, which is a slightly too long time ago, I remember the 1980s, uh, some of you may not, Remember that? Uh, and back in those days, if you wanted to, to see a film, you'd have to go to the movie theater and they would tell you which film you had to watch. Uh, and there would be five or six, or you had to watch television and there'll be a number of films on and some people would decide it for you. Even if you were buying music, then you had to listen to the 12 tracks that the record company had selected. Nowadays, I can choose that I want to listen to ACDC as well as Mozart, as well as Tupac on one single playlist. Uh, you might say that says something about my musical taste. We won't go into that. Um, uh, and it is odd, by the way. Uh, but but you're allowed to be odd. Uh, Daniela mentioned that I was a referendum nerd, but I might be a, a nerd in many other ways. We're all allowed to be our own little nerds. Now, the problem with democracy is that democracy is still stuck in the same groove as the LPs of the 80s and the CDs and the movie theaters. You get one list you can vote for. You can vote for one party or you can vote for another party and that's it. Um, and in a concept that I'm developing currently with, uh, with, uh, with Daniela, uh, the other Daniela, who's also on the screen, we're talking about uh, complementary democracy. And really de de democracy on demand is, is also part of the complementary idea of democracy. Now, representative democracy is a wonderful thing. It is just not the only show in town. Um, we need to have elected representatives, and Daniela, you've just been, uh, you, Daniela, uh, uh, you've just been elected uh, as representatives. You're an enthusiast for direct democracy, but you're also an elected representative, and we need to have both. But we need to have, we need to upgrade democracy from this sort of 1.1 to the 2.0 uh, democracy. We need to have democracy for adults, uh, because we are, all of us, uh, clever enough, uh, informed enough to make actual decisions. And therefore, democracy on demand is ways in which, all the complementary ways in which we can also participate, not just every four years uh, voting for a particular party that we probably only agree with on, on, uh, on, on a few issues. Uh, you have an election in those of you who are in Germany uh, in, in a few weeks' time, uh, well, few months time actually uh, and and some of you will say well I only agree with 60 percent of, of, of the parties at most uh, is that enough no you need to have other ways into it now that's sort of like democracy on demand is is, is that idea of, of giving responsibility to people in also allowing people to to if you like as we say in Britain, have your cake and eat it. And there's no reason why you shouldn't have your cake and eat it. You should be allowed to choose. You should obviously be allowed to choose policies um, sort of in a bespoke sort of way. Uh, I mean, if you're allowed to choose something as unimportant as, um, as, as tracks on your playlist or the, the, the movies you're going to watch on, on Netflix, or um, then why aren't you allowed to choose policies, especially at a time when we have so much information at our fingertips? When I voted in, uh, in the first um, uh, elections back in the day and referendums back in the day, I had to go to the library to get information. Now I just type in a few things and I get all the information and I can make up my mind. Now, the other problem that we have uh, in democracy at the moment, and, and this is a little bit more uh, one of those things where people say, well, that is a problem, a referendum is not going to help, well, direct democracy is not going to help, is polarization. We have a lot of people who talk, very few people who listen. Whenever I'm in, in public meetings, um, I tend to get very angry, probably you do too, most of you, and sometimes I will say to people, are you listening to me? Uh, and when I say, are you listening to me, 
that means that I am certainly not listening to them. Um, because we, we, we tend to have that. And we need to go back and more fundamentally look at this idea of democracy as discussion. I think Thomas Masaryk, who was the first president of Czechoslovakia, uh, defined democracy as, uh, as discussion and a way of life. Um, and, um, and I would like to just go back to, to that particular argument and say a few things about this. And this is sort of like the more philosophical part of my conversation here tonight and and I am in my uh, in my real life I am a professor of political science so you'll have to bear with me for being a little bit academic you know um, so if we we have to look at what do we mean by politics and what do we mean by policy um, there's a very sort of classic definition of politics which says that politics is the sphere where you distinguish between friend and enemy it doesn't mean that we're going to kill all our opponents. Sometimes you feel like that. Uh, but, um, but politics is very much this sort of like adversary kind of game. I am from this party or I'm from that party. And especially representative democracy is politics. So if politics is where we distinguish between friend and enemy, we might say, well, how do we overcome that? We overcome that by looking at, and this is where we have a distinction in English, which I, I'm not sure you have in, in other languages. In, in, in German, for example, it's politique, and politique can be, uh, you know, both issues as well as can be sort of party politics. But in, in, in Britain and in America, and I guess in Australia and New Zealand as well, um, we have a distinction between politics, which is the battle, uh, the friend and enemy kind of field, and then we have policy, which is, uh, and policy can be defined as where you distinguish between feasible and not feasible, or possible or not or possible, or implementable or not implementable. So policy is about practical issues. Is this actually possible? Is this actually going to solve the problem? Whereas politics is about uh, the battle of, of different um, political armies, if you like. So representative democracy is fundamentally politics. That's the battle. Whereas um, direct democracy allows us to actually discuss issues. So when we are discussing issues, that can be whether it's a, a, universal, a universal basic income or it can be pesticides or it can be house prices, then we're not looking at the issues of which camp are you in. We might occasionally do that, but the fundamental issue is that people actually talk about is this actually going to be possible? If we introduce uh, rent control, for example, it is okay. in, um, in, uh, in, in Berlin, I believe, uh, if, they, if we introduce that, then the debate is, is it going to work or is it not going to work? Um, so, so direct democracy is a thing that requires us to talk to each other and listen to each other. And this will move you on to, to sort of another more, if you like, philosophical aspect of democracy. Now, if democracy is discussion, then the fundamental thing about discussion is that we listen to people. And when we listen to people, also means that we learn from other people. We should be open to learning from other people. When I'm uh, teaching my students about uh, what we call deliberative democracy, which is where sort of people try to talk about it, I always sort of give them a single task and I try to ask them to do a single thing for a whole week. Every time you enter into discussion with anybody, try to learn one thing. Uh, so if I were to enter into a discussion with Viktor Orban or uh, Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump, I'm just using a couple of, of, of random examples here, then I should be open to learning at least one thing in my discussion from those people. Uh, whether those people are then going to listen to me as well is perhaps an open question. I haven't had discussions with any of those individuals. Um, maybe that will change. Um, but, but try to, as an experiment, uh, have that have an openness in your discussion. Because if you have that openness in discussion, say, I can actually learn something, then we might be able to move the agenda in a different way. And having these different mechanisms, by the way, is what we have with what's known as participatory budgeting, where you give people responsibility to, to hand over those things. But I just come back to the idea of um, what um, we sometimes have called deliberative listening. That's not 
a thing in my book, but that's we're sort of moving on to the thing that we're developing at the moment. But the idea of democracy on demand is that you allow people to demand when they want to have a say on issues, not a say on in the battleground between political parties. It is issues by issue based politics. Things can be debated as policies rather than adversary politics. But if we can, can go back to this idea of democracy as listening, then we can also say that it is fundamental in democracy uh, that we learn from people. Throughout the ages, when we, you know, when we go back to, to the ancient Greeks or the philosophers in the Middle Ages, then they all say that democracy is there because even the most intelligent and clever people can benefit from the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, when Aristotle, great Macedonian, a Greek philosopher, depending on what, what side of the fence you're on down there, uh, but when Aristotle wrote his great book on politics, he says democracy uh, or, or constitutional government, as he called it, is preferable because even if the most intelligent people have a lot of answers, they don't have all the answers. Uh, our friends from Taiwan uh, will know a, a, a Chinese saying that is that saying that, that three stupid shoemakers know more than the wisest man, because the, the, the three individual shoemakers collectively know more. And therefore, the more stupid shoemakers we have, the better. And, but all of this requires that whoever is in power, who has ever been elected as representative to represent us, has to listen to us. And we also, in turn, as being co-lawmakers, have to listen to other people and engage in that debate. Um, you can say that democracy is listening, democracy is learning. And it has been also been said by a woman called Catherine Bateman, an anthropologist who says, we are not what we know, but we are what we're willing to learn. And democracy is very much that we are what we're willing to learn. We're willing to listen to other people. We're willing to be corrected. We're willing to, to move forward. And that is the reason why democracy is vastly superior to any other system in the world. And why direct democracy is vastly superior to systems that only have representative democracy. Um, I can see that when my time is sort of approaching to be up, uh, isn't that right? Uh, Caroline is, 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 is nodding, okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty much here. I've pretty much reached the end of the line. So democracy is discussion, democracy is listening, democracy is being open to other people's ideas. But whenever we, we then have these, uh, and, and it, it also is foc focused fundamentally on depolarization, because we don't want to have these polarized debates between, you know, the battles between different political parties we actually want to solve problems. It's another thing that you, if we, if we, 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 we can, you know, in, in politics, politics is not about winning the argument. Politics or policy is about solving the problems. And we can only solve the problems if we, if we are allowed to contribute to solving the problem. Now, there might be sort of hard-headed empiricists out there, that's what I I would call them if I was in university setting, or just being skeptics or cynics who would say, well, that's all good with all your direct democracy and all of that, but does it actually work? Well, the fact of the matter, we can read more about it in my book, the fact of the matter is that democracy and especially direct democracy works. The richest, the most uh, successful countries on all matters uh, are democratic countries. But if we then look at the subset of countries that have elements of direct democracy, countries that have democracy on demand, if you like, then they tend to be even more successful. The most successful states in America are the countries in the West, they have the num highest number of patents, the highest number of, of innovative ideas and environment, like the places like Oregon, uh, Washington State and California. Uh, the uh, overall best place to live in the world is Switzerland. Well, the Swiss give the people the responsibility to, to, to enact policies. Um, but if we want to have sort of statistical facts, then in all the league tables, when they look at, at happiness, then happiness is correlated with the number of referendums that you have in that country. And also, if you are then getting really sort of focused on the GDP per capita and how are you going to be richer or poorer, then there is a very simple statistic that I'd like to cite for you, and I'd like to, to pretty much finish off with that one. And that is for every referendum that is held, for every extra referendum 
held, the average citizen will be a thousand US dollars better off. So if you have 10 more referendums, you are statistically speaking likely to gain an extra $10,000. Of course, it doesn't work as neatly as that, but overall, statistically speaking, you get richer the more you allow people to engage in democracy. And on my just sort of final note, I would like to quote a, um, a, a line from a long gone British uh, politician called Keith Joseph. And Keith Joseph was uh, a minister in the early 1980s and he was asked why all this democracy and he was, you know, at the time when the Russians and the Soviets were in the ascendancy and he said, well, democracy gives people uh, responsibility and if you don't have democracy, then you take responsibility away from people. So, and this is a quote, if you give people responsibility, they become responsible. And if you take responsibility away from people, they become irresponsible. And I think we should allow people democracy on demand so that they can become more responsible citizens. Thank you very much. And thank you, Matt, for this very, um actually a hopeful book, uh, hopeful message, sorry, on how to take democracy forward. Uh, I'm thinking about a book because um, your, up, your book, Democracy on Demand, will be published next month. Um, and you kindly arranged that participants uh, from this event can, um, can purchase it at a discount. So I just want to point out that there's a link for that and a discount code in the chat um, that you can use. Um, and now after this, um, this sort of philosophical fundamental look at direct democracy um, around the world, um, we thought it would be really nice to bring in, to bring in some specific um, regional pathways um, for a future um, of direct democracy. Um, and so at Democracy International, we are very lucky to have a, a wonderful international board with people um, from all over the world um, who are really experts um, and um, who are very passionate about direct democracy. Um, and so um, without further ado, I would like to um, start with uh, the person who's the furthest away from us and for whom I think it is also the latest in the evening, um, Professor Jung Ok Lee from, um, from South Korea, who, as I said, is a, is a member of our board. Um, she is also an honorary professor of sociology at the Catholic University of Daegu. Um, and was the Minister of Gender, Equality and Family uh, for the Republic um, of Korea. And uh, Jung Ok, I would like to offer you the floor. Thank you. It is great honor to have this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my experience in this special occasion of uh, 10th anniversary of uh, Democracy International. I was already introduced. My name is Jungkook Lee from uh, Republic of Korea. Can you share my slide? So, just uh, because uh, I should present myself in three minutes in 33 slides, just to go through. <laughs> Will you check? Just, just, just go. So. Yeah, I came from here. So uh, I was in charge of organizing so uh, global forum in modern direct democracy in 2008. So I have participated in all the continuing global forum except Daichung. So let's go. So uh, for for last uh, 10 years, uh, all, I thought 10 years all the Democracy International has provided a space of mutual and uh, participatory learning. Finally, it has constructed a global partnership beyond the international mutual learning, I thought. So I can, I will share my experience with the snapshot. Uh, go, <laughs> will you just go? Uh, snapshot, uh, uh, snapshot, starting with the study tour to Switzerland in 2008. Go, let's go down, yeah. It's uh, in Switzerland again, go down, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> in, in Hungary and uh, finally in United States. So we can see the familiar faces also. In United States, it was really participatory learning process. So, 
So again, the mutual learning and uh, go down, <laughs> yeah, go down, yeah. So Global Forum has uh, become global community of the democracy, as I said. So, and then the, the gap between the decision making and the responsibilities and the burdens of those kind of decision making became very widened. So in Korea, go down. In various social movements in the Republic of Korea have been triggered against and for better decision making. Go down. <laughs> yeah. So you can see the all those demands. <laughs> And uh, uh, the challenges of democracy are based on the partisan differentiation of a police agenda, weak social basis of political party, weak infra of democracy value. Go. go. <laughs> yeah, pass. Pass. Uh. So how to build a democratic governance? So you can see pass. So we have discussed the for last 10 years more deliberate and direct democracy. The, next, yeah. And uh, in Korean context, we have uh, practiced the plebiscite and the nowadays uh, to in democratic govern, government deliberation. So those kinds were practiced. Pass. <laughs> So, so for there are various kinds of decision making. So for the very delicate nuclear reactor building issue, university entrance examin examination issue, which were very difficult to decide. So those were go to plebiscite. And also uh, finally, we have adopted the deliberation process also. Yes. Yeah, but uh, we did uh, the huge decision making was done by deliberation process, but uh, it is like the problem of representation. So random sampling, who, who did the random sampling? The most of the technocrat has been involved in this process and uh, only 471 uh, citizens were selected and uh, those kind of uh, selection process and also representation of those uh, citizens were also related. Pass. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pass because time is so limited. You can pass down next. But uh, so deliberate pro go dark. down. Pass. Yeah. So for the, I think uh, all those kind of, uh, based on all those kind of uh, process, uh, we have uh, public tools such as media and education and the legal basis should be strengthened. Otherwise, all those kind of practices are still in a weak state, in a weak state in decision making process. Good. Yes, uh, global democracy has been institutionalized. I thought uh, the Democracy International can play the significant role with the, the more governmental or uh, intergovernmental organization UNDEF and the community of democracy process. Yes. Pass. <laughs> Uh, I thought there, there remains new challenges which is related with equism, related with the sustainability and the feminism and the migration and the refugees, how to make, in, how to inclus be more inclusive in those areas also. Yes. So especially for women's political representation is going to be very beneficial in deepening democratization because it can go beyond the nationalism and the reinterpretation of value and tradition and uh, uh, how to reorient in a, a civilian control of a consumption culture. So in that sense, uh, 
uh, it, this kind of uh, women's political representation can deepen the uh, democratization process. Trust, pass. And then we are faced with COVID-19. I thought uh, through these challenges, uh, economy and the public service and uh, so social uh, regulation should be should be combined with the deepening democ the, the democracy. So we were all awakened through this kind of painful experiences. Down. <laughs> And uh, COVID-19 and the human security first policy could have political consensus uh, in this uh, pluralized partisan uh, politics. So I think we have uh, one, uh, some kind of opportunity in this uh, tragic situation. So common security politics of cooperation are based on information sharing awareness of necessity of mutual cooperation and the participatory construction of a security check and social distanciation. Yes. Finally, so I was in Berlin with my students, uh, with uh, uh, the Dr. Mampod and uh, uh, those uh, have helped my students. Those next generation will take a continuing, continuing journey of direct democracy by crossing the border. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jung Ok, for sharing that with us. Um, and we will have time for um, some questions from the audience um, afterwards. Um, if you have any questions, you can also post them in the chat and then we will um, hope to get to them. Of course, we also. Um, want to keep an eye on the clock at the same time. Um, so I would now um, like to go to um, to the colleague who is closest to Cologne of the three board members we've asked um, to speak. That is Mehdi Ben Mimoun. Uh, Mehdi Ben Mimoun is a professor at the um, sorry Institut National Agronomique de Tunisia, um, the University of Car Carthage. Um, and he, um, he has been a long-term um, democracy activist and he, uh, among other things, has helped us organize the 2015 Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy, um, which took place in Tunisia. Um, and Mehdi, I would like to, um, to ask you to, um, to share a little bit the perspective from Tunisia and from Africa um, with us um, and to give us a hopeful vision for the future. Thank you, Caroline. Uh... I need to share my screen, so if you do it or give me the authorization for that. You should be able to do it. I think it's better if you do it because there seems to be a little bit of a delay when I do it. Okay, okay thank you. So I'm going to present to you um, about for Tunisia. The first thing is that uh, Need to pass to the second one. Okay. I hope that Tunisia will not be the exception uh, in the region and we will have more democracy in the world region and we will not be in some years the only two uh, country in, in our region. Uh, I hope we will be strong in Tunisia with all the consistent constitutional call that we are stay, uh, still waiting for it since now uh, seven years. For that, we need to consolidate the democratic choice with greater citizen involvement at the local level. Uh, it could be done with more solidarity with Tunisian needs for implementation of program for living via. We need to have a better quality of public leaders uh, I think the best way for that is to work with young people from all regions with a high sense of serving their community. And about referendum in Tunisia, in our constitution, where there is a limit uh, choice for referendum. It's the uh, president uh, in circumstances. 
So, and it's about ratification of treaties, the freedom and human rights or personal safety. So it's really limited uh, uh, subject where to have a referendum. However, if we go to the local government law, there is much more possibility to have a referendum at local level. So 10% of local electors can also initiate a referendum or the two third majority of the council members. So I hope in the next years, we will have the first referendum perhaps at the local region and let's dreams come true. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mehdi. Um, I believe we can stop screen sharing. Yes. Um, thank you very much um, for that um, quick insight into the situation in Tunisia, and we will talk about it a little bit more afterwards uh, in our panel conversation. Um, but I, finally, I would like to um, offer the floor to our third board member, um, who is Joe Matthews. Um, he's a journalist from California, um, from the United States. Uh, he works for Zocala Public Square. Uh, they are based in Los Angeles, um, and they um, they do a really great brand of journalism, uh, which tries to go beyond the news um, and really does in-depth uh, human stories. Um, and um, I hope that uh, Joe can give us a little bit of a hopeful view from California. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so uh, welcome. Um, this is a holiday weekend um, here in the United States, the, the Independence Day, the 4th of July tomorrow. Um, and you know, at this time of year, uh, we hear this this old story of the United States is being formed from this great democratic revolution where we cast off our, our British rulers um, and formed a, a great new constitutional republic. Um, but it, that, that, that story is, um, is hard to hear and doesn't really cover the half of the country that I live in, um, the West, uh, where the story you know, here in particularly the American Southwest is how um, in the late 1840s, uh, we were conquered uh, into the United States in a very legal and imperialistic war uh, that the United States conducted against Mexico. Um, so um, in that context, I, I find myself thinking and, and being asked to offer specific ideas, specific dream um, for democracy and direct democracy. I find myself thinking of the constant conversation disinformation, misinformation, and co conflict, politics, and human costs of um, our obsession in this country with the United States-Mexico border. Um, populist governments in the United States and also now in Mexico um, have tried to impose all sorts of things on the border region, um, both policies about migration and how migration is handled that have deep costs for the border region, the border, the people who live on the border and are trying to cross the border, people on both sides of the US-Mexico border. It has become a dominant um, subject in, um, in United States politics um, and is somewhat, and a significant one in Mexican politics. Um, the, the different, there's also an enormous difference between a, a huge chasm, a Grand Canyon style, size gap between the lived reality of actually being at the border and the, um, the media and sort of political narratives around the border. And the political media narratives, the border is this great source of problems and conflict. To actually be at the border, you see communities that, that, that and people who move across the border uh, as part of their lives, their work, their education, and their everyday lives. Um, but the people who actually live and work in the border region are not really part of the conversation. The decisions are made by people who know very little about the region in Washington, DC, and Mexico City. Um, this strikes me as an enormous opportunity um, for uh, transnational democracy to take root. Why, why don't we at Democracy National or somebody could come together and, and sort of map the border region? We could talk about the six Mexican states or the four um, uh, US states that are on the border region. We could declare that the border region or simply say the border region is everything within 100 kilometers of the border. Um, and then we could convene a citizens assembly with the goal of the, of the people who live and work in the border region actually gathering and trying to decide for themselves how it would be better to govern the border. Um, 
with actually in the basis of realities rather than political and media narratives. Um, they would, might create a structure for border governance. Perhaps that border government structure could include, my dream, um, elements and tools of direct democracy to allow people on both sides of the border um, to propose ideas, to propose policies, um, to govern that border region. Seems like an enormous opportunity um, and fully justified again by the failures. We've seen just in recent years, everything from concentration camps put together by the United States government on the American side of the border um, to some abusive Mexican policies that, that, allow, that, that, that allow migrants, that keep migrants on the Mexican side of the border and put them in, um, in living conditions that are uh, unhealthy um, and profoundly dangerous. It's time for the border region as a place that has been lied about and neglected to rise up and to govern itself uh, democratically. Um, and that's my um, idea for uh, this moment. Um, I wanna say this, um, uh, I should close by, by saying as the co-president of the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy, um, I hope this is the kind of idea we'll hear about in Mexico City in 2023 when we bring the Global Forum there. Um, and we will gather actually, uh, expect to gather very near the Zocalo, um, which from which my organization here LA takes its name, um, which is the, uh, the, the central square uh, of Mexico City and of the country of Mexico, um, where all kinds of different institutions come together and people come together for all kinds of different reasons. Um, thanks so much for being here. Thanks to Democracy International and happy birthday, Feliz, feliz Cumpleaños. Thank you, Joe. Um, yes, and so um, before moving on to the second part of our event, which will be a little more interactive and where we would like to give you all the chance to, to talk to each other um, more uh, detailed, um, we want to have a quick uh, Q&A with our four uh, speakers um, who we've heard from now. Um, if you have any questions for them, uh, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I have some, uh, some questions. Um, and um, I would like to start off specifically um, with a question to, to Jung Ok and Mehdi. Um, you have mentioned um, the, um, the, the, the generational shift that is coming. You've mentioned the change of mentality that is coming um, with young people. Um, I know also Jung Ok that you have um, talked about that in previously, previous meetings we've had, uh, specifically in the context of the presidential elections that are upcoming um, in South Korea. And so I, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more um, about the opportunity that presents itself um, with, um, with young people coming into politics um, and, um, and the, the opportunity that that has specifically for direct democracy. Um, so I don't know um, who of you would like to answer that first. Feel free to unmute yourself, yeah. I believe Jung Ok is trying yeah. to. Sorry. Uh, it is very uh, complicated because uh, as, uh, as our keynote speaker has already pointed out, most of the younger generation, they are more oriented into policy issue, which is closely related with the more direct democracy rather than politics. But uh, those kind of their political will were, were not adequately uh, integrated into existing system. So they are usually uh, they are usually absorbed by existing partisan politics. So, uh, so because of them, they, they, the existing party political leaders or, or party members thought the young people are very mobile and flexible and the swing voters. So they, they, they want to be very sensitive for those kind of swing voters. That is one uh, react one reaction. The other is they want to make them more representative through uh, through some kind of biological representation. So they invited the more younger parliament candidate for younger decision. That they provide a position to the uh, biologically younger people, but. Uh, uh, usually the, those young people, they, they don't want to be represented by, by their even peer groups. 
they they are more sensitive in their own uh, the policy agenda. So some kind of communication gap between existing political groups and the younger generation, generation I think it is a kind of a, uh, misunderstanding uh, sometimes uh, make uh, existing uh, politics became more complex. So I thought uh, the, the role of direct democracy is, is, has become more important in this specific situation. That was my understanding. Yes, please, Mehdi, go ahead. So for, uh, I know for the different list for the election, there is a percent of young people that must be in the, in the list. Uh, so there is some young people in parliament and in local municipality. Uh, 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 However, the participation of the young uh, people in uh, uh, decision make, uh, making is is uh, is very uh, uh, very low, and their participation to the election is also very low. So we need to to bring them to uh, uh, to the public sphere, and I think one of the way for that is to to work on uh, policy and in in local. Uh, at the, at the local uh, uh, national level, and why I'm deeming work with young people uh, uh, in the region and to lead their fair and to bring a new generation of uh, of of people uh, for uh, for for Tunisia. Thank you very much. Um, in the meantime, people are posing questions in the chat, and I will just uh, pass one along um, to Professor Kvortrup. Um, You've mentioned that every referendum makes us $1,000 richer. Um, the question is, does that apply for all political levels? Uh, so somebody is trying to figure out how much money <laughs> we are going to make. Yes, uh, well, it's, it's a national level referendums, but if you look at the places where you have uh, referendums on local level that also uh, works but my calculation just before you uh, renegotiate your bank loan or whatever uh, is based on on national government uh, national referendums but um, one can see the same tendency in uh, traditionally in places in Germany where they have folks begin and folks up and now of course all the lender in Germany uh, have that so it's impossible to compare but historically speaking the, the more successful ones in of the German lender for example have also been the ones where there were elements of uh, well in rather imperfect direct democracy but, but certainly had an effect there so it's it's overall uh, it's the national referendums but it, it is a case of we have to have all of the above uh, democracy is a complement, we have complementary democracy. We shouldn't just have um, referendums and initiatives. We should also have, as Joe was suggesting before, citizens assemblies where representative uh, people come together and say what they think is the problem and what they think is the solution to the problems. So we have to have all of the above. Um, that Let a thousand different types of democracies bloom. Uh, I think would be the slogan we should have. We should have citizens to uh, citizens juries. We should have participatory budgeting, referendums, and even the recall possibly. Um, more accountability makes politics uh, better and 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 people ultimately rich. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's also a question for Joe in the chat. Um, the, that question is, would it be an idea to pilot, uh, to pilot start a proposed democratic border polity at the local level between Tijuana and San Diego? Um, I have a national level question follow up, um, or not exactly uh, follow up, but um, um, Professor Portrop has mentioned that, um, that, that direct democracy is a way out of polarization, that it is important to keep discussion lines open, um, and especially in a country that has, um, that has a, a lot of polarization because of two different uh, 
um, political parties that are, um, it's, it's basically in, in essence a two-party system, even if it's not um, legally a two-party system. Um, would a national referendum be a solution um, for polarization of politics um, in the US? Please go ahead, Joe. Okay, um, I'll take the first one first about the, um, about you could pilot sort of Tijuana and San Diego. Essentially that's already happened in Tijuana and San Diego. Um, those, the local governments on both sides of the border um, have a long history of cooperation um, in parks are right next to each other. And Tijuana has had a lot of progressive leaders, not so much the most recent mayor, but um, who, who are from San Diego, were educated there, grew up there. This has been a pretty porous border. Um, there were even attempts to, you know, jointly bid for the Pan American Games or even talked about the Olympic Games jointly cross border. Um, there's an air, airport, when a new airport was built on the Tijuana side, it was built um, right on the border in a way that um, with a terminal and an entrance on the San Diego side. I mean, there is a, there is a hunger for that kind of cooperation um, within the border region itself. Um, but it is blocked by um, by federal policy. And so that's why I think people in the border region um, need to, and I use this phrase uh, advisedly in a wildly different context, and Europeans are interested, uh, used to hearing it, take control um, of their own region um, on both sides because they are one region and people have that understanding in a way that people far from the border don't. Um, so yes, I mean, I, and then you see similar things in, you know, El Paso and, and, um, and Juarez. So it's, um, it's that, I mean, th that the, the border region would do a better job of governing itself than Mexico City or Washington DC have. Um, to the question of national referendum, I think there are a lot of great reasons for national referendum to, to hear voices, to, um, um, to, ins to try to get um, um, I think da Daniela, you know, used the, the, the phrase as sort of the, the frustrated majority or the kind of entrapped majority in her country. Um, there are a lot of issues in which there's strong majority support for change in the United States that are frustrated by the American system. I think the referendum brings that in. I don't know if that will be depolarizing. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I'm, I can say that. I, I, I would say that when I talk, when we talk about polarization and direct democracy in the United States right now, I actually am deeply concerned that polarization is undermining direct democracy structures. Um, we're seeing a strong trend in recent years as, as states, um, since we have direct democracy at the local level in all in 49 of 50 states and at the state level in half of them, what you're seeing is that as one part of the other gains total control in a state, they limit direct democracy um, using the legislation in the courts. It's of a piece you, you may, if you read American media, you talk a lot about new legislation from Republicans in different states limiting voting, but getting less attention or efforts to limit uh, direct, the use of direct democracy. I mean, dramatically in Florida, uh, the Dakotas, um, Mississippi, essentially a court ruling, a partisan court ruling effectively ended their direct democracy. It's still on the books, but it's now unusable. Um, so I, I don't, I, I mean, I do know that polarization can hurt direct democracy. Can direct democracy overcome polarization? Um, that I'm less um, uh, certain of, but I mean, there are lots of great reasons for national referendum and I would represent recommend for anyone who hasn't uh, read it. Um, my, um, my friend and Los Angeles neighbor, John Matsusaka's book, John being the, the head of the Initiative and Referendum Institute of the US, um, you know, Let the People Rule, which explains many reasons why, you know, there would sort of be a little bit of oxygen into the peculiar American system if we had national referendum, even just advisory. Um, sort of, or agenda setting uh, referendum or initiatives as we see with the, like the ECI. Thank you very much for that. Um, then with an eye firmly on the clock because we do have to move to the second part um, of our event. Um, I have one closing question and I would ask um, that I would like to pose to all of you. Um, and I would ask you to, to answer in like one, two sentences um, just to, um, to be brief. 
Um, so um, you have all um, hosted uh, a global forum on modern direct democracy. Uh, Joe, you are the co-president of the global forum on modern direct democracy. Um, and uh, Matt, you've, uh, you've been uh, to global forum of, on modern direct democracy. Um, so in your view, um, were there any lasting effects of it? Um, what is the, the value of organizing uh, meetings like this? Um, that, how has it influenced your work? Um, and yeah, how has it changed things um, for, for democracy activism in your country? Matt, you can go first, please go ahead. Yes, I think uh, it is a case of demo Democrats or direct Democrats in all countries unite. Uh, I think that the fact that we have this meeting now, the fact we had the meeting in, in, in Taiwan and we've had meetings before means we all get together, we get to learn from each other, we get to compare notes and uh, we get to also in the spirit of listening, listen to each other's mistakes. So the fact that we are actually all together from different countries from different continents means that we can also all march forward together. So. Forza Democrazia, uh, let's move forward, let's uh, conquer the world together. Um, I'll answer. Um, our, our forum in 2010, um, um, it was very hard to host these things, you know, because um, Bruno has always very big ideas and uh, that are hard to execute. Um, but um, I have heard repeatedly the forum in 2010 in San Francisco cited as the place where which really kicked off a, a reform effort, a modest reform effort of the California process that brought a little more deliberation uh, into the process, including the ability for people to agree to take measures off the ballot once they qualified. We didn't have that before. Um, also, signature petition circulators got a as part of that reform effort, which finally was enacted in 2014. Um, petition circulators got more than a month. Um, certainly the the process is credited by our friends at Oregon and Healthy Democracy for the spread of that citizen's jury idea uh, to other states in the U.S. Um, I'm also sort of struck by the, uh, the change in mindset amongst a lot of people in direct democracy in the United States who've heard of the forum and the conversations out. I remember in 2010, the Americans we were partnering with, um, including my good friend Paul Jacob, who may be on this call, were so skeptical of the relevance of, of examples from outside the United States that they insisted on. We essentially, it was two forums. We had one that was a couple of days of international and then we had three days of all about the US. They were separate, they were segregated forums. Um, I'm not sure why I agreed to that, but I did. And um, you know, ultimately um, a lot of those folks changed and started to look more seriously at Switzerland and other places around the world and Taiwan. Um, and they're now, you know, newly minted democratic internationalists. And I take um, uh, great pleasure of reminding them how close minded they were before, um, before we all got to them. Jung Ok, would you like to uh, give us a little bit of an insight in, in how it was after the South Korea forum? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, because uh, usually this concept, uh, global, combined with the global, modern, and direct democracy, three different uh, uh, concepts were come together. So because of that, it was very difficult to organize or, or organize that forum in the beginning period. So uh, one thing I learned, so, I know how, how, how much sweat were driven uh, by, by Joe and Bruno in each uh, preparatory uh, process. So democracy cannot go smoothly. <laughs> so it needs some, some people's, some kind of, uh, some people's polit political, moral, and uh, wisdom and will uh, put together. So I, I learned, all those kind of organizers in San Sebastian and Montevideo in Taichung and uh, if those kind of event uh, make it happen, all those kind of endeavors should be put together. So we, uh, we, we became easily a member of a community. So it, it is a one thing, good thing. So like-minded people who, who really want a democratic society, 
uh, were together and uh, we, we, we thought we were not alone and uh, we were very, we were not alone. So that, that was uh, encouraged us very, uh, for to go further our journey. So sometimes it goes smoothly, but sometimes go directly back. But always we were together. We share the the difficulties of collecting the signatures and the, once the collecting the signature, but the many many others are waiting for us, even in those kind of advanced country in Switzerland and the United States. So in that sense, I, I, I learned the, the democracy is closely related to global, and also it is, uh, um, it is uh, in modern and postmodern and uh, further modern, we, we, should, uh, we should make it modernized uh, by ourselves and uh, should be more direct rather than whether whether we are always in complementary situation, but I think make it more direct so that the, I, I, I know the I bear in mind those kind of missions, though, though it is not enough in our in our country context, but the, the, the target is there. So and with like minded people. So that was the greatest strength for me to go forward. Thank you very much, uh, Jung Ok. Uh, and then finally, yes, let's uh, let's go to Tunisia, where the forum took place at a very interesting time in 2015. Uh, please, Mehdi, go ahead. So it, it was a real uh, interesting time because it was just a few months after the 2014 elections, which uh, was a very partisan election with uh, people in politics fighting uh, against each other. And I think the global was a very important occasion to have them uh, sit together and discuss about real problem and to show that uh, to our students and to people in Tunisia, that uh, it's possible to have people sit and discuss about problems. Uh, it was also important to listen, share and compare experience from uh, other parts of the world. And for me, it was an uh, important occasion to discover this beautiful community of direct uh, international democracy and direct democracy. Thank you very much for that. And thank you to, um, to all four of you, um, our wonderful speakers. Uh, Matt, thank you for that uh, really insightful keynote. Um, and um, thank you for, uh, to Mehdi, Jung Ok and, and Joe for joining us from all corners of the world. Um, many of you have mentioned it, um, and and um, and uh, this is uh, what we wanted to do with our second part of the event: is really put the spotlight on on this network that we have because we are really proud of that. Um, these many wonderful organizations um, that work on direct democracy around the world, um, experts and activists alike. Um, we would be nowhere uh, without the great work that you do. Um, and so we sort of cheekily decided that we want to have an activist uh, speed dating session. Um, we've called it that. Um, I'm just going to explain a little bit 